All right, once again, welcome to Webinar Wednesdays. I'm your host, Brian Williams, and I'm so grateful that you took time out of your day to join us here for this program. For those of you who have never had the chance to meet, um, so I'm Brian, I'm from the uh, St. Thomas in the US Virgin Islands. I am a 100% certified island boy. I love anything hot. I love beaches, I love sand, that's my jam. My family and I, we live in the Washington DC uh, metro area. My beautiful bride, her name is Lisa. We've been married now, going on 19 years. And our children, um, Briley and Bali, Briley is 10, Bali is six. So we, have, so we have a full house here in the DC area. And my passion more than anything else is I love to see people be treated well. If I can, all, if, if I can sum it all up, my whole thing is I love to see people treated exceptionally well. No matter what they call, whether they call customers or guests or clients or, pa or passengers or coworkers or direct reports or people who you report to, I love to see people treated like they're VIPs, you see? And I love to see people who come to work with a sense of pride and passion and professionalism for their craft. So with everything going on in the world, with the pandemic, with the COVID-19s and so forth, it can be very easy to focus on what's wrong with things, yes? It can be easy to focus on this is wrong and that's wrong and there's layoffs and there's furloughs and there's business closing or, or suspensions and this and that, and those are all valid and they're very real. I mean, you and I read the news, we, we, we watch the news so we know what's going on. However, I'm a firm believer on whatever you focus on is what you will get more of. Your energy will be reflective of whatever you choose to focus on. And that word focus means everything. The word focus, as you all know, means that you are deliberately putting your attention on something. You don't accidentally focus. It's a choice. It's deliberate. You focus on something to the point where you're blocking other things out, but also focus means that whatever you are looking at, whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're putting your energy on gets bigger. See? So you're blocking things out and you're making things get bigger. So on webinar Wednesdays, the whole purpose of this is for us to focus on what's right, focus on what's going well, focus on how we can continue to sharpen each other and to keep lifting each other up, continue spreading love so that what's right now happening will be behind us and we'll focus on what's coming in the future. And each week, we have some special guest experts who are going to be helping me to answer your amazing questions. And you all put together some questions. What? We have a few, we have five questions and we'll see how many we can get through today. But each week we have different questions we'll be answering uh, with one of my guest experts. And today's guest expert, I don't know if you can do a drum roll with Zoom. I'm not sure if you can do a drum roll or not. But her name is Theo Gilbert Jameson. And I met Theo been over 20 years ago. And I want to give you a little synopsis. So one of my jobs working in the hotel business, I was a director of training and development for the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company. And many of you on this call, you all know that. Well, when I first got this job of director of training and development, I was about I want to say maybe 23 years old, 22, 23, and I'm 26 now. So this is like three years ago. I'm totally lying right now. No, I'm 43. So this is 20 plus years, 20 years ago. My first day in the job, director of training, big experience for me. The job I had immediately preceding director of training, I was the employee cafeteria manager. Had nothing to do with director training, but somehow, through the grace of God, I got this amazing job, this amazing opportunity. On the first day, and I don't even know if Theo remembers this or not, but Theo called my office to speak with me. And Theo at the time was vice president of learning and development, vice president of training and development for the Ritz Carlton Hotel Company. She was the top person in charge of training for this luxury, iconic brand, and she took time out of her busy day in Atlanta, Georgia, that's where she was based, to call me on St. Thomas, first day, new job. That just spoke volumes of her character, and it just let me know, man, I was a part of a family. So I'm grateful that she's on this call right now, and I'll let her give a quick introduction of herself before we jump into these questions. So Theo, please introduce yourself to everyone. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Brian, first of all, for allowing me to be a part of this. This is just really incredible as we're all um, 
socially distancing, I guess. It's so great to be able to get together with people. I'm kind of like Brian in that, you know, my entry into the, to the professional world or even the hosp hospitality world, I started as a secretary in human resources and um, had the wonderful opportunity to work my way all the way up to vice president of learning and development. So it's been a pleasure. I've known Brian for many, many years. He is so dynamic. So it's just a great honor to uh, be able to share a little bit of knowledge with you all and also with Brian. Wonderful, wonderful. And Theo, tell everyone what you're doing now, uh, your, your, your vocation right now. Yes, okay. Well, right now, um, I'm working on a, uh, as we're doing this social distancing and distance learning and virtual learning, I'm working on just a series of uh, micro learning videos that can be utilized as part of daily team huddles. So they are, they are on all different types of aspects of how to elevate the customer experience. So as we're all looking at how to utilize our time, how to strategically move from one thing to the next so we're ready to go, that's one of the things that I'm working on right now. Really excited about it. Yes, Theo is an accomplished author. You have three, is it three or four, three books? I have three books, thanks. Three books, the accomplished author, world-renowned keynote speaker. I mean, um, Theo, Theo departed the Ritz Carlton Hotel Company and started her own consulting and training and coaching firm. And she did that years before I did the same thing. So she, in many ways, laid the, um, the groundwork. She blazed the trail for people like myself to do what I'm doing. So thank you, Theo. Wonderful. My pleasure. Now, now listen, for everyone here on the call, whether you're tuning in from California or from the Caribbean, because I know we're from Caribbean people here, or Florida, or wherever you are in this world, if you have a question, use the chat feature, just like you did previously, and I'll be doing my best to answer your questions as they come in or at, or at strategic breaks that we're going to put in here. We, we should be finished um, before 3 p.m., um, but let's get started, shall we? The first question we have that both Theo and I are going to be tackling is, in today's current economic climate, when managers have teams that are on furlough or waiting to return to work, how would you recommend we keep our team members motivated and calm until we see economic resurgence? Theo, I want to have you um, give your perspectives on that first, because that's a very real situation. It really is. You know, with all of us, I'm sure everyone on the call knows someone that's either furloughed, they're working at home, or and there are a few people that are actually still in the office. And what I love about this question is that I have a great example that resonates with it. I've got a friend that's a receptionist with a large church. And in their church, of course, just like everyone else, um, they've decided that people that can work from home will do that. And they've got just a small skeleton crew of people that are working in the church office. But in talking with her yesterday, she said, would you believe, and, and it, nothing against the people in the church, wonderful people, but she said, nobody's called to see how we're doing. You know, how are families? We're the ones that have to come in every day. Um, and so that was really interesting because a lot of times when you think about communication and keeping people motivated, we really focus on the people that are away from the office, but it's important to keep everybody, everyone in mind. Uh, with that said, things that I'm doing, and, and, and just like Brian, I keep in contact with all of my colleagues. Some of these may be things that you're doing, some of these things you may want to do with a little more rigor, but just simple things like making sure that you're doing brief telephone calls, emails, or text messages with your team to ensure that they know that we still care about you, we're still here, here's an update on what we've got going on, and even recognizing people's birthdays. You might say, Sally Sue's birthday today. It's John's 20th anniversary, you know, things like that. Those little things are so important. Before I turn it back over to Brian, you know, just one more thing. Uh, when I was coming up in the corporate world, we always talked about having an open door policy. And uh, in many of our handbooks, that's there. Well, in the virtual world that we're working in today, I think as leaders, it's important that we have a virtual open door policy. And what that means is that as you're connecting with your teams virtually or however you're doing it, you're letting them know that they can still reach out to you as a leader via, via a text message or phone or, you know, email, whatever works so that they know that there is still someone to be connected with. So that's just my contribution to that. That's perfect. That's perfect, Theo. You know what? I'll tell you, there's nothing more potent then one person saying to another person, how are you doing? Just genuine compassion, 
genuine caring. If I reach out to Lori Strom or Amanda Adams or Brian Walsh, all of whom are on this call right now, how are you doing? How's your family doing, right? How, right now, I've had several calls like that since this whole thing started. People come checking on me and I've been doing the same to reciprocate to other people. So I agree with you, Theo, communication mm -hmm. is key. Yeah. Empathy is key, right? Genuine concern is key. And this is not the time at all to be stingy with your encouragement. This is the time to lavish it thick. You know, like when you have like some good peanut butter or almond butter or whatever kind of butter that you use and you want to put that thing on liberally, this is the time to liberally spread, liberally spread that love, liberally spread that encouragement. If, if there's ever been a time in human history where people need encouragement, it's right now. No one needs to hear anyone else complain about how bad things are. We can see it, right? But share it, but then let's keep it moving on to something that you can do to lift somebody else up because that's what we all need. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would and add to that, you know, everyone has a, a feeling of anxiety right now. So it's just, again, as Brian has expressed, so important that whether we're a leader or a regular employee, whoever we are, that we just help to stay in connection with each other. So, and that's just one way to provide that great sense of calm. And it makes people feel greatly appreciated, more important than anything else. Yes, and when people feel appreciated, they naturally do much, much more. But I would say um, uh, the, the other part of the question was about how do you keep people motivated and calm until we see economic resurgence? We literally don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. I know that we all know that intellectually, but in this situation that's happening right now, every day is bringing something else. Something that's either building or building or building. I know here in the United States, things are getting, they're, they're literally still building. So we don't know when things will be resurgent, resurged or when there'll be a resurgence, but we can have faith and we can communicate with our teams what we do know. If you don't know anything, then communicate and say you don't know anything. <laughs> but do it in an empathetic manner. Excellent. Next question we have, I want to touch on here, Theo, is what kind of things can we be working on now to set ourselves up for success upon return? What kind of things would you recommend teams and leaders and organizations work on right now when there's such a great pause? This right now is the great pause, or I call it the great control out delete. What can people work on right now? That's a, you know, just another excellent question. I think about um, probably about a week ago, um, you know, or, or maybe about two weeks ago, for everybody, things were moving fine. And then all of a sudden, we just had this abrupt stop of everything. So, right. you know, the first mm -hmm. week for me, like many of you may be, I was kind of like stunned with, I don't know what to do next, because we've never experienced this before. But now as we're moving into... Um, you know, the next phase of this pandemic and, and being away from work and so on, what I've realized is that it's a good time to do a couple of things. You may also be doing these things now. One is some strategic planning. And I'm not talking about a 26-page, a you know, white paper, but just looking at what are action plans that I need to put in place so that when my team comes back, we're ramped up and we're ready to push the go button. Because I can tell you that to, to get back economically sound as an organization, we're going to need to be ready and prepared to set that go button and hit the right. ground running. So that's number one for me. The next thing that I'm working on is, and many of you think about all of those things that we wanted to improve, but we didn't have time. Standard operating procedures, training mm. manuals, um, you know, the list goes on. Processes. How many times people, are, our employees say, oh, my God, we need to do this different or that, but we just don't have time as leaders because we're in the business of work. This is yeah. an outstanding time to look at those processes and stuff. So that's also something else that I'm doing. And then one more thing that I'm doing, as we're doing now, relationship building. Remember, those that know Stephen Covey, and I even think Simon Simic says something similar but that we want to work on, this is a good time to work on the emotional bank account. Yes, so what am I yes. doing to set myself up for success? Networking with some of my colleagues, with people that are in my industry, keeping that emotional bank account so that I have homegrown relationships when things start back. And the great thing about uh, building people's emotional bank accounts is that you realize that, you know what, um, you can gain great best practices from what other people are doing and they can do the same from you. 
So strategic planning, process improvement, working on those business relationships, that's what I'm doing. Yes. You know what? Before I share my, um, my couple of comments, Alicia Santa Maria, who will be one of our guest experts um, in a few weeks, she mentioned um, one of the other things we could be doing as we're trying to keep our team members motivated and so on is paying attention to the tone of our voice and making sure we are warm. As we all know, most communication is not the words we use. It's in the visuals, it's in the nonverbals, in the tones, in the inflections, it's in the pauses. So thank you for that, Alicia. I appreciate that. Now, to build upon what Theo said, which is phenomenal, one of the things I would strongly encourage is look, relook at your vision statement, your mission statement, your core values. And I don't even necessarily mean from an organization wide perspective, I'm talking about for your specific team. If you are a department head, even, look, even if you are a shift supervisor with your team, just think, start thinking about mission. Why are we here? What do we do? How do we do it? Why do we do it? Put all, answer all those questions to infuse into your mission statement. In addition, look at your service standards. Theo mentioned standard operating procedures. But I'm talking mm -hmm. about the overarching behavioral expectations that's required of everyone. I'm telling you, if we, not if, when we come out of this uh, chapter in human history, if things, if your processes and your systems and your services and your products are not exponentially better, shame on you. Shame on me. Ethio? Yes. Shame on us if we come out of this the same as when we, as when we went in. I mean, this is the opportunity for everyone to just tie the belt buckle, shine their shoes, comb their hair, like me, I gotta comb my hair, you know? You gotta get your thing, get, 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 get your thing. As my wife would say, you gotta get it right. Get it right, <laughs> get it right. This is the time to get it tight and get it right, all right? And does anyone have any comments about this? Things that we could be working on now to set ourselves up for success upon return? Use your chat feature. Let me see what you have to say. Any, any, any comments on this? And while we're waiting on, um, on comments, you know, Brian, you brought up a great thing, a great point. When we come back, we were in a new normal. When we come back, service excellence, the customer experience has got to be absolutely on point. Mm. Um, it's not going to be any time for coming back and trying to get things together. Things have to be together, on point, ready to go. Because people have been home, or, or for those of us that are going out, you know, maybe every so often to get some groceries or whatever, you know, we're all trying to stay in if they're asking us to stay in, but we're really being sensitive to the level of service that we're providing. And when people come back, you know, they'll be a lot more discerning and, um, and we want those customers to come back right away and start spending money with us. And the best way to do that is to make sure that, that they have a bar none exceptional experience. Yes, absolutely. Even identifying things like your touch points, you may call it um, your, your customer mapping journey, but the simplest thing is called touch points. Identify all those points where your customer is interacting with you. So phone call, entering your business through email, and there's a lot more virtual emails and things going on right now, virtual meetings. All of those things, pay attention to them so that you can look at each touch point and ways to make deposits. Just real quick, um, in terms of uh, additional comments, Amy Overstreet said that um, she's de um, decluttering her office and getting more organized to be able to hit the ground running. Amy, I feel you on that because I am doing the exact same thing. My office has been in desperate need of a major de declutterization. I don't know if that's even a word. But that's been something I've been working on as well. Alicia says, visioning. What do you want your team to look and be like when this is over? I love that, Alicia. Closing your eyes and really dreaming. This is your time to dream. Because in the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle, you may, you may not have the time. Or you may not take the time because things are so busy from the time you get up and the time you go to sleep. But right now, visioning. What do you want your team to look like? As Stephen Covey mentioned, I know Theo mentioned Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind. Amanda says, I, I truly believe how employers are treating employee, hold on. I truly believe how employers are treating employees during this hard time will only increase loyalty when we return to normal. That's right. Do your team members feel like they've just been dumped by the wayside or do they feel genuine care that you have for them? 
I love that. Um, and Keila, hold on, Keila Morris says that I'm strengthening my brand's online presence so that I can, hold on, so that I can stay in tune with my clients so it's easier to connect with them when we can welcome them back. Beautiful. Maura says, what advice do you have for people who are still working with their staff, who are still coming into work, even when so many are staying safely at home? I think this is the time, um, Maura, to talk about a deep appreciation for their sacrifice. Knowing so, I mean, people are at work, meaning that they're exposed to the virus and whatever the case is there. This is the time to regularly and liberally show appreciation just for their sacrifice. I think you should talk about that. Obviously, a lot of people are out of work completely because whatever they're working has shut down or has been closed for the time being. So I think gratitude is another part of the equation, saying that I actually get to go somewhere to work. Many people don't have a place to go to work. So that's another piece. Yolanda says, the silver lining of this period of pause is it allows for self-reflection clarity of purpose, and determining how and where you want to serve. Each individual investment is a deposit into the collective survival and growth. Yeah, this is some great time, Yolanda, for all of us to do some deep assessment of ourselves. What do I really love? What do I really not like? And being okay with that and reshaping and re-engineering your job, your role, your career, so you can be more in alignment with what you are called to do. Let me just pause for a moment. Let me just go back to that real quick. I'll turn back on my video. Just, to, just real quick. There's a lot of people who are who have been doing jobs, got college degrees in a particular, and they genuinely don't like doing it. Right? They've gotten a job, they've gotten their degree, they went, they were told you get this degree and all these extra degrees and you do this and you work your nine to five or whatever the case is and then you retire. But during that whole time, they know for a fact in their heart that they're not into it. And that's not okay. Because when you're not into something, it affects how much you put into, into that craft. You will never exceed expectations or look for ways to do more than what's expected of you when you just kind of barely putting your heart into it. This, just like, just like Yolanda mentioned, just, this is the time right now to have an honest conversation with yourself about yourself. What's my calling? What am I yearning to do? What is it that I do that I always thought was a hobby, but I can't really get paid for it? Man, I want you to refute, rebuke those thoughts. I want you to really think about Whatever it is you're called to do, there's other people willing to patronize it, willing to pay for it. I don't care what it is, even cutting paper, even sweeping the floor, even coming up with an online design, a template. There's something you are put on earth to do. Huh? There's something that you are put on earth to do that the rest of the world needs from you. Feel there's some things that you can do that no one can do like you. In the history of this world, there's never been another Theo Gilbert Jameson. Even if they had your name, it's not you. Right now, even if you had a twin sister, of which I don't think you have a twin sister. <laughs> not but even if, yeah, but even if you had a twin sister, Theo, it's not you. After you are gone from this earth, Theo, there will never be another you. That makes you rare and valuable. And Theo, anything that's rare and valuable is called a masterpiece. That means you are a masterpiece. And the, the, the really cool part about this situation, Theo, is that if you are a masterpiece, logic shows that I'm a masterpiece. It shows that Amy's a masterpiece. Elise is a masterpiece. Brian's a masterpiece. Blake is a masterpiece. That means that we are all forbidden from trying to be like someone else. Because I can never be a better you than you. That means, that leads me to say, well, what am I put on this earth to do? And how can I lean into that thing and do it with full confidence? Knowing that that strength came from somewhere that's higher than me. It came from the higher power. In my case, that's God. They came to me so I can give to other people. Whatever gifts you have is for other people. All right? So don't let me start on this because we can go on and on all day just on that topic. <laughs> All right. All right, hold on, let me make sure I didn't miss anybody. I think I, I thought I missed a person or two with this chat. Real quick, real quick. Uh, Lori Strom, she says, we are a healthcare system and feeling the intensity 
of this COVID-19 situation. And just so you know, Laurie, I just want to say right now, God bless you. God bless you and your team. You guys are the healthcare heroes. You're on the front. You all need super capes, superhero capes, as far as I'm concerned. It says, we are blessed in that our CEO and board are supporting daily outreach videos to all 13,000 plus coworkers that include prayer every day. Our senior leaders and chaplains are praying over patients and families, nurses, all coworkers, leaders. Very meaningful and so well received. See, this is the kind of thing that we need more of. We need more praying over people. We need people to call people and say, listen, I am thinking about you. I am praying for you right now. That's what we need. So thank you for sharing that, Lori. Theo, let's continue on. Our next question is, how, now, this is not specific to the, our current climate, per se. It's just overarching leadership and organizational effectiveness. Mm -hmm. How can a mid-level leader okay, positively influence the behavior of upper-level leadership? Yeah, I saw that. That's a really tough one. And I can remember being a mid-level leader and thinking the same thing. But, you know, I want to go back to a wonderful quote from Mahatma Gandhi, which says that we need to be the change that we want to see in others. And I may actually be paraphrasing that, but it's something to that extent. And it just reminds me that um, even in middle management, you know, to realize the circle of influence that you have. Um, so from my perspective, some things that I would say in order to influence upper the behavior of upper man, upper leadership or senior leadership, Couple of things, one that we, that we should start. If I'm a mid manager, start by being a role model, the walking, talking epitome of what I think the expectations of senior leadership should be. You know, we always say that you should, you know, look the part, walk the part. And I just think that it's important to role model those senior leader behaviors that you expect, especially when it comes to how we communicate with others our attitude, making sure it's positive, our professional presence, even in our leadership skills. Um, what we should stop doing, and this is a kind of better pill, but sometimes we have to stop looking to senior leadership or upper management for all of the answers. I've been at every level. I've been a front level, a frontline employee. I've been a supervisor. I've been a mid manager, department head, division head, senior executive with a fortune, you know, with a large organization. And we're all human. So, you know, what I would say is instead of looking to upper leadership to do all and be all, we should look at, you know, what contribution can I make to the organization? I think Brian kind of touched on that in the last question that we had, you know, seek out ways that you can be a great contribution to the organization because, excuse me, a lot of times people are looking at you. You don't realize it, but senior leadership, upper management, they're really looking. And if you can come back to the table with ideas and ways that either you can improve your team or that you can improve the overall organization, that is the greatest contribution and influence that I think that you could make to any senior leader. And I say that coming from the perspective of having been uh, as Brian said, Vice President of Learning and Development over a multinational organization, we were always looking at, you know, ideas coming, bubbling up. And those yeah. were the th those people that, that constantly had new ways that we could be more efficient, be more effective, show more compassion, help people understand their purpose, make sure that we're providing the best cu cu customer experience. Those are things that influence uh, upper management or upper leadership. Excellent, excellent. Uh, listen, Theo, just real quick, Kayla Mara says that your hair is beautiful. Oh, you know thank that. you, Kayla. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, like, you are kicking. You're slamming thank right you. now. So, you know, I tell you, looking for ways to add value. Blake Feeney mentioned that everyone is in a leadership role because everyone has a, a circle of influence. Everyone has influence, nice. whether you're in a formal leadership role or an informal leadership role. And in many cases, you and I both know, that uh, a lot of the times the informal leaders are even more influential than those who are in the formal leadership positions. So with that being said, let's assume that Dorothy Tardif, who's, who's on the call right now. Hi, Dorothy. <laughs> and say hi to Don for me. Let's say that Dorothy is on the, Dorothy is, is my leader. And uh, I'm, so I, I'm also, I'm a mid-manager. Dorothy is my senior leader. Dorothy and Richard Simtop, well, both of them. Dorothy and Richard are my senior leaders. The first thing I have to always keep in mind is what 
is important to them, right? What's on their plate? What is on the senior, what, what, am I, what are the goals and objectives, the strategic objectives and priorities of whomever I'm reporting to? That is the first and most effective thing you need to figure out when you're talking about managing up, because the question is about managing up, basically. What's important to them? Because if I know that for Richard, that his biggest thing is employee engagement, then, then you know what? I'm gonna figure out ways I can do things or prioritize my work, prioritize my action steps to be in alignment with that. And I would let him know, I would say, Richard, these are the things I'm working on. And I know these are in alignment with the overall goal of uh, increasing employee engagement. If for Dorothy Tardif, if one of her big objectives is increasing overall profitability, then I'll make sure that whatever I'm working on is deliberately and clearly linked to profitability. And then what you'll have is that you'll have more buy-in from the senior leaders into whatever you're trying to work on, but you're doing it from a place of adding value first. Don't ask for anything unless you add value first. I want, you know what, let's pause for a moment. I want you to use your chat feature. I want you to write those words, add value first. Let me see them, let me see it, let me see it, let me see it, I'm gonna wait. Uh, yes, Amy, add value first, add value first, Kendra, add value, Rebecca, add value first, Nilda, add value, Anthony, add value first, Alicia, add value first, beautiful, Donnet, yes, yes, I'm seeing it, I can feel it, I'm immersing myself in this, I'm bathing in this right now, Dan, add value first, don't, add, listen, the sun is not shining because of anything we did, our heart is not beating because we did anything. Huh? The air is not there because we put the, these things were all gifts given to us. Yes. So I have no right to ask anyone for anything whom I haven't given something to first, including those I am reporting to add value first. Excellent. Excellent. And what one, I love one to other, you, Brian, if yes. I could just add, because someone wrote it a couple of uh, uh, comments back that leadership is not a position. And I love that because leadership really is a mindset. It's a behavior. And what that means is that anyone can be a leader. And just as you're saying, by adding value, that in itself um, contributes to being a highly effective leader. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one, one of the other ways you can, uh, uh, that's effective to influence of a level of leadership is um, numbers. <laughs> numbers work. Don't come to your senior leaders with anecdotes and opinions come with numbers, come with facts, come with a spreadsheet that's showing why, quantitatively why. You know why? Because your senior leaders, more than anything else, they, they look at spreadsheets a lot. They look at numbers a lot. Their decisions have to be um, data driven. So if you're not coming with data, they're not gonna look at you as professional as you are, as you really are. So two things, add value first, two, come with numbers. All right? All right. Now, that's, that, <laughs> Next question is, um, why do some leaders, after empowering, and the, the question actually has quotes around it, why do some leaders, after empowering their associates, still hold the strings in their hands? They say, I'm being empowered, but eh, why do people do that? Why do some leaders do that? What do you think, Theo? Well, you know, to be honest, another brilliant question, a lot of people just really don't know what the definition of empowerment really is. You know, people think that empowerment is delegating or giving somebody a task, but empowerment is really about giving people the freedom to do the job the best way they can. The operative thing is after they've been properly trained. So when the yes. question asks, you know, why does my leader empower me? And then they still hold on to strings. In a lot of instances, it's because Deep down, they know that they've given you something to do, to do, but they don't trust. And it's not that they don't trust you because you're a bad person or whatever, but deep down, sometimes they know, I really haven't provided Theo with everything that she needs to be effective, and I want this to, to turn out right, so I'm going to still hold the reins. And so, you know, as a part, a part of empowerment, it really is making sure that people are properly trained first, so to empower someone before you delegate a task, you need to make sure that they have the, the competence to actually do that task. And that's where as leaders, sometimes we fall short. So then we hold on to the reins. And when we hold on, when we give, when we empower something to someone, but then we kind of hold tight to it, with, a lot of times we don't realize is that 
creates disempowerment and demotivation. So, you know, that's an exceptional question. And I think my answer to that would be that sometimes we just really don't understand the definition. And if we did, we would realize that empowerment comes after you properly train someone. If you don't yes. train somebody and you, and you ask them to do something because you're delegating or empowerment, empowering, yes. all you're actually doing is dumping a task on them. Think about that. So we owe a lot yeah. of people apology, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, Theo, uh, you and I, we, we both grew up in an organization where empowerment was a big thing. Yeah, Rich Carlton's. In fact, you right. could be, you could be, I've seen people get written up for not empowering themselves to take care of something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a serious business. The thing about empowerment, and I love, and Kelly Everts, who's on the call, Ke Ke Kelly said um, a lot of the reasons why people don't empower their, their staff is because they lack trust in themselves. Like Kelly, there you go. they lack trust in themselves as a leader and in their teams. Now, I'll give you a quick story. And some of you on this call have heard this story because I've said it in the past. Man, I was, I was in a hotel, I was in a hotel gym, and I'm on the treadmill, right? And right outside the treadmill, is the, right in front of me was a window. I can look outside. I'm in a hotel, on a treadmill, window in front of me, I can see outside. And this gentleman is on the, he's on the phone, walking, pacing back and forth. I can see him clearly messing up my whole workout zen I had going on at, at the time. Mr. Phone Man decided to come into the gym. But Theo, he didn't just come into the gym. Mm -mm. There was about 10 treadmills lined up, of which I was mm -hmm. on one. The other nine were empty. Where do you think Mr. Telephone Man got on? Which, which treadmill? Yours, I guess, are close to it. <laughs> <laughs> the one next to me, not on mine. That'd have been really weird, right? Okay. <laughs> he got on the treadmill on the one next to me. But he not uh -huh. only got on the treadmill next to me, Kelly. He decided to start talking to me. He starts saying to me, oh, they need me. And I can't, these people, they can never do anything without me. And I got to be on every conference call and blah, blah, blah. It was kind of, he was complaining in a boastful manner. Mm -hmm. He kind of liked it. Huh? So I decided to indulge him. I decided to take out my earbuds and I looked at him and I said, well, why don't you just try turning your phone off? <laughs> that way your team can have, they're forced to make decisions. He looked like he was about to pass out. He looked at me and said, no, they need me. And that's when it hit me. It's not that they needed him, it's that he needed to be needed. He there needed to be called and texted and relied on and CC'd and involved in everything. And in so doing, he's stifling his team's ability to think. He's robbing them of the opportunity to take initiative. And taking initiative is a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. But the dysfunctional part is when he turns around and now complains to them for not thinking. That's the you know, to add to that, to yes. add to that Brian, uh, Nicole says that um, one of the reasons that leaders don't um, empower is because they're insecure. And mm. um, I didn't want to be bold enough to say that, <laughs> but that is the absolute truth is that a lot of times leaders, they don't want to, if, if I empower, empower Brian, then it's going to show my, my deficiencies, you know, and, but, but the thing, but that's not true leadership. True leadership is that, you know, I may have some deficiencies, but my team closes the gaps in those things. Um, so I just love that somebody said that because that's, that's just so important. And, you know, we have to remember that in order to empower, you have to know the person's capability. You have to know people. Otherwise, yes. again, you're just nothing yes. stuff on them. You got to know them, rigorously train. I'm big on training. And then provide coaching when they don't meet your expectations, that will happen. Someone said you have to take risks, you know, so you have to be able to coach. And this is where we fall down often is that we empower, person does a stupendous job and we don't go back and recognize. So that's important to go back and say, Brian, Kelly, Tamara Sue, you did a phenomenal job, thank you so much. That means so much to people. Yes, Nilda says the true empowerment is the best form of development. I'm telling you something, I could not agree more. I mean, I got Theo, when, gosh, uh, Theo, when, I remember when Theo was working at the Rich Carlton Leadership Center, and I was a director of training at the time now in Atlanta. She empowered, she um, delegated things to me. She empowered me to help with different things with the Leadership Center. I wasn't even part of the corporate team yet, 
right? So I appreciate yeah. that. It develops people so, so very much. Now, the thing about it, empowerment is not the task the person does. The empowerment is not the action that they do. No, empowerment is caring enough to do something. Yes. See, that, that's, that's, that's really what I'm, when you're asking, so when, when you're saying, team, you are empowered, right? What you're really saying is, I trust you to care enough to do things without asking me first. That's really what empowerment is. It's not the task. It's I trust you to do whatever you need to do because you care and you don't have to come and ask me first. When you might date, the person has to come and check with you first and that's not empowerment. Right. See? Yes. And also, it's, it's, it's also worth noting that the vast majority of organizations on earth do not empower their staffs. That's, that's not a normal thing. If you find yourself in an organization where they empower you, consider yourself as blessed. You are part of a very rare group of organizations. Most companies don't do that, regardless of industry. Yes. And I'd like to add to that too, Brian, that if people as leaders, as we go home and we're like so worn out every single day, hmm. we need to ask ourselves, Am I delegating? Am I developing? Someone mentioned development. Am I developing my team so that I can delegate and they can be empowered? Because if empowerment is just the, the highest form of recognition. I mean, people just feel so valuable. When you empower people and you recognize them, they'll, they'll, they'll move Mount Everest for you. They will go above and beyond for you every single time. Yes. Now, now Stacy Worsher has a great question. She says, how do you get these leaders over this empowerment? Or basically, how do you get leaders to empower? <laughs> uh, how do you get leaders to em empower? And, and, and I think that's what Stacy's question is. How do you get, you know, and I'll, and I'll tackle this one to you. I will say you can't make anyone do anything, right? You can't make someone care. And this is also a great point to call out. Theo used the word bold, but I'm just being real. This is a great time to call out that not everyone in a leadership role should be leading people. Right. Not everyone should, should be leading people. Now, yes, we can all learn how to lead. We can all read the books and we can all listen to the podcasts and watch the videos and go to the conferences and read the articles and attend webinar Wednesdays. We can do all these things, but deep, deep down, it comes a point where you have to ask yourself, do I really like leading people? And it may not be something you're comfortable saying out loud if the answer is no. You may only reveal that to your significant other during pillow talk, right? Because if you really, 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 really enjoy leading people, then you will naturally want to see them be developed. And as Nicole and Kelly mentioned earlier, one, one of the best ways to develop someone is to empower, not dump, empower them to do things. Excellent. All right. Yes, yes. Now, now, next, and, and, and this is our last question before we, we, we start to um, take some more, any other questions from our audience here today. I want to thank you once again for everyone tuning in because I mean, there's so many things I could be doing right now, but you're on this call because I know that we are all not, we're trying to reconnect, keep us connected, right? But in addition, we're all learning together because I'm learning just as much from you as you are from Theo and myself. The last question is, for our call today. Communication continues to come up as a top concern for our company. We have 250 employees, and I'm curious what we are not doing correctly in order to effectively set up the proper communication portals. So basically, um, this question is from a leader who, whenever they do employee surveys, communication or lack of communication is a big issue, right? And they put different things in place, but it's still a big issue. Now, Theo, what are your thoughts on that? Wow, I had so many thoughts on that one. Um, I love the question around communication. Um, you know, that there are a couple of things that employees will never get enough of. You, yeah. it, surveys show it. You never yes. have it, hear an employee say, I got enough communication, we get enough recognition, we get enough pay. You know, as leaders, or, or, we can't always impact all of those, but communication we can impact and recognition immediately. When I look at this, many of our organizations, we're moving heaven and earth to make sure that we communicate in every capacity, but yet we still hear employees say, I didn't hear that, nobody told me, I didn't know about this. I mean, this happens everywhere all the time. 
what I recommend is that we use, you know, when you think about process improvement, we all hear about the five whys to get to the root cause. This is definitely one where Brian and I could give you a million remedies, but I would say that we need to go back to our team of employees and ask them, what are we doing or not doing that, that gives the, the impression that we are not providing proper um, communication? Because this is one where you'll scratch your head with the leader until you scratch your head until you can't anymore. So that's what I would say. Go back and ask your employees, you know, the five whys. If you ask them why five times, here's what you're going to come up with. Well, communication comes out, but I hear it from another department. I don't hear it from mine. Well, we don't get communication consistent. Well, the way that you guys communicate is not effective. And they'll go on and on and on. But you first have to find out so that you can, otherwise, you're going to just be spinning wheels trying to figure it out. Ask the employees. What can we do? What are we doing wrong? And then put that team of employees together. And this can be done virtually also. This is a perfect time as we're all having to do things that we did. We're all out of our sphere of maybe comfort when it comes to communication. But uh, that's, that's the type of question that needs to go back to the audience to find out how can we be better and empower them to come up. Look at that. Empower them to help come up with the reasons yeah. to get better. Full circle, beautiful, beautifully said, Theo. And I agree with you. I think if you think you're doing something, if you think you put all these processes in place and they're not working, then you got to go back to people and say, hey, then what, what are your expectations on communication? Yeah, what are your expectations? And that's where those are the things that may not show up in a survey. That may come out in a focus group, right? On a conference call, things mm -hmm. like, like, you know, that, those, are the, those are the areas where the real answers may, may, may um they come out. This kind of reminds me of a time when I was working with uh, a skilled nursing facility in Florida. So a nursing home in Florida. And this has to be maybe eight or nine years ago. And I went to this organization because they were looking into some potential assistance around consulting to help them increase their culture. They want to enhance their organizational culture, right? So I did some focus groups. And um, one of the things that came up was this same exact situation. Communication, oh, actually no, the team didn't feel recognized, that that's what it was. It wasn't communication, yeah. it was recognition, all right? The team didn't feel recognized. And they showed me this report, they being the senior leaders who brought me in, and then I asked them, what are some of the processes they have in place for making their team feel recognized? And they literally feel, they brought a book, like a thick, a thick book a binder basically. And the binder had like, it's, it seemed like over a hundred different ways of how to recognize the staff. Yet, recognition was one of the top concerns. So year over the year, the team didn't feel recognized, which was in no, there was no alignment with the amount of ways they recognize people. That tells you that the way they thought were making people feel recognized were ineffective. And I think this is the same situation. Yeah. when it comes to communication is communication is not just what you say it's about also listening in fact most of the communication is listening <laughs> i would say and the majority of us have never taken a listening class yeah so most of us when we think about communication we think about sending messages where we're, we're saying words where we're, we are writing something but a lot of communication is sitting back and listening on what's heard. So the complaint about communication could be really a complaint about the team not feeling heard. Right? I think that you've, you've hit it on the spot. So often when we're talking about communication, we're looking at all the things that we're not doing. And sometimes it could just be as simple as what you said. The issue might be that there's nothing, that there's no process for communication to flow back. That's phenomenal. I hadn't even thought about that. So hats off to you for that, Brian. <laughs> High five, tag team. We put yes. tag team on this thing, Theo. <laughs> yes. You know, hey, we, you know, as Any leaders, we're so often trying to look at how to fix things. And sometimes it's so simple. Yes. We don't even go back and ask the people. And when we do, the, all the answers reside within the organization. You just hit it on top of the head. If we don't know what we're doing correctly. Let some communicate, ask the people and have the communication flow back. That's wonderful. Yes. And Theo, you just said the most quotable, tweetable, Instagrammable thing on earth. You just said well, most of the answers 
re um, reside in the organization. All you have to do is ask, and, I, and that's beautiful right there. Yolanda said, um, actively listening, a simple thank you and sincerely expressing specific feedback for something that a team member did goes along with, with recognition and communication. Cassandra Archer says, how do they prefer to receive communication is an important question. You know what, Cassandra, that is so perfect because you may be thinking that sending out your paper newsletter or your newsletter is effective when they're just saying, listen, all you got to do as an organization, set up a Twitter account or a Facebook page or something, and, that's, and we're on that anyway, and let's, and let's communicate in that method. Maybe a web based um, group text messaging type feature where you can text the CEO, whomever, and get a response in real time. That might be something. Carrie Soderberg, Carrie from California. Sometimes labor laws get in the way of the most effective way to communicate. Hold on, let me go back to this. Sometimes labor laws get in the way of the most effective way to communicate. The form of communication that is most desired for my team. Exactly, thank you so much, um, Carrie. And um, Blake, says, uh, thank you very much to you and BW. <laughs> Great to hear your positivity and passion. <laughs> Beautiful. So at this stage, I want to open the floor up. Any, any comments or questions about whatever Theo and I mentioned or any questions specific to Theo or myself? The floor is open. We are here for you. Yes, big hugs to you as well, Carrie. You know, Sharon says, day 20 of quarantine. Thank you both for all the great reminders. Yes, Nicole says, empowerment is so connected to the whole picture. A nonverbal empowerment is leading by example. Yes, mm -hmm. Anna says, thank you for such positive reinforcement and practical guidance. Alicia says, she could be organizing her spice cabinet. <laughs> but thank you for providing this opportunity. Good, good, good. Um, hold on, let me see here. Blake, Blake Feeney, hold on. Blake Feeney says, um, Lead and manage by walking around and looking your staff in the eye and saying thank you. Yes. So and if you can't do it in person, do it virtually. Okay, we all have webcam. Use your webcams. Uh, Amanda Adams, I Spa. Thank you so much for all of this. So uplifting. Charlotte Gar Fines Garcia, thank you for sharing your warmth and light. It's all about communication and knowing we are not alone in this. Oh, Lisa McCallis. <laughs> okay. I have a request from my friend, Lisa Vicalis. Okay, I'm going to tap it in. Lisa is saying, can we connect with you on Instagram? Yes, and in, largely because of uh, Lisa's prodding and basically bear prayer pressure and bullying, I'm on Instagram right now. So Dr. Brian W. I just put it in the chat feature, D-R-B-R-Y-A-N-W. I just started Instagram literally last week. So y'all better go on there and follow or like whatever you do on Instagram. <laughs> Naomi says, yes, this is very helpful. Ah, Jamie says, you are light bringers. Nice, nice. Good, good. Well, I'm going to, let me just go back here. Theo, please let yeah. us know. Um, I know you mentioned what you're working on right now with, with, with the small videos, but I could have sworn I heard through the grapevine that you also have an amazing um, resource, uh, uh, a huddle guide resource. Yes, I do. And, yes, and thank you so much for asking. You know, in the just like with you, Brian, a lot of our clients, when they ask, how do you create and sustain a culture of excellence? And we teach both of us that daily team huddles is a great way to communicate, recognize, set the expectations. All the things that we talked about, set people up for success, all of those things. So what I've yes. been doing is putting together this daily team huddle guide that provides leaders with just little snippets of things that you can talk about every day so that with all of these types of questions that we're coming up with, that you stay on top of your A game every single day. So I'm just really excited about that. So thanks for sharing that. Yes, and look, um, you know, back, I think one of the questions was about how can we keep our team motivated during this time? Having team huddles, having virtual mm -hmm. team huddles is a great way of doing that. And one of our yes. great clients in Lincoln, Nebraska, Talent Plus, they do what's called a daily formation. That's their huddle. Eh? They do it at um, 8.45 a.m. Central, Monday through Friday, right? And they do it every day. Usually, usually they'll do it all together in the corporate office. But um, now they, they, they use um, 
technology to do their team huddles. In fact, yesterday I was on their team huddle, on their daily formation. Um, Janelle asked a great question about how can we get the huddle guide. Janelle, we'll include uh, information and a link to that in the follow-up email. You and you are going to send your follow-up email, especially you, Janelle. <laughs> uh, well, we're going to send a follow-up email um, within the next few hours. They'll have a, a, a link to this video, yes, along with any of the follow-up materials, including um, the, the guy that Theo so graciously put together. And how many, is it like six months, Theo? What is 25 weeks of information covering 160 days. <laughs> and then when you get to 160 days, then you start over again, because you know re repetition is so important. People have to hear things over and over again. So that's kind of, and, and I'd like to thank you, Brian, because you've been very instrumental in helping me uh, put that together. So you get to hear, uh, see a lot of his great expertise in that too. Uh, thank you so much, Theo. Well, Chad, Chad Barth, Entertainment Cruises, he, he mentioned, he said, Brian and Theo, for those of us who manage hourly hospitality members who currently are without work, how can we quickly get them back to a level of motivation such excitement once they're able to come back to work, to quickly focus on that amazing level of hospitality that we need to bring back once restaurants are back open? So basically, for those of you who, have, who are hourly hospitality people, right, who many of them are out of work right now, most if not all are out of work right now, how can we quickly get them back to a level of motivation and excitement? Well, the first answer is you hire people like Theo or myself to come in and provide some training for your team, right? But Theo, what, what perspective do you have on that? I think daily team huddles, you know, not to talk about the huddle guide in, in particular, but daily, you know, then the people get that, then your team gets that, that little shot that little, that little inoculation every single day. And they're going to need that when they come back because, you know, people have been home. Um, some, not everybody is at work right now. When they come back, they're going to need a constant feeding of little microbites of how we can be better as a constant reminder. Takes us back to what you talked about very early, reminding people of what the purpose is behind the work that we do every day. So just those daily team huddles will help with that tremendously. First class, absolutely. And I strongly encourage that. I've, I've been a part of seeing how Theo um, developed that great program and it's literally scripted, scripted like five or so minutes a day, Theo, about five to seven minutes mm -hmm. a day. You do your right. huddle, it's all scripted questions on every topic imaginable. Um, mm -hmm. So I highly recommend that. Pete Sitnik says, um, thank you for doing this. I wish I could jump right in right now and make this all happen. I know, Nicole says, amazing, thank you, beautiful. And uh, Carrie, huge thank you. Julie Jansen, thank you for your time. This is so helpful. Alicia, and again, Alicia, when are you gonna be, I think I wanna say, Alicia, you're gonna be on, uh, oh my gosh, in two weeks? I wanna say it's in two weeks, Alicia Santa Maria. Uh, amazing, amazing, amazing lady. And she's an expert, expert in all things related to not only organizational improvement, but specifically workplace, conflict resolution and so forth she's usually one of our key speakers at our strong leader institute which is, is we, did, we, had, we had to postpone it this year obviously but we're doing it again next year in um Bill, colorado same place next spring date forthcoming and then um this fall we're doing our bw leadership academy in orlando florida october 26th 27th all right becky everybody nicole reese there you go reese nicole gilpin Excellent, excellent. Ex oh, do you have any suggestions for fun team games that can be played in a virtual happy hour <laughs> with our teams? Any suggestions for fun team games that can be played in a virtual happy hour? Do you have anything there? Because the call might get cut off in just a moment. Any, any thoughts there, Theo? None at this point. I have to think on that one, but that's a great recommendation. <laughs> Yes, even if the old two truths and a lie or anything like that, I think that would be helpful. But um, yes, let me see what else. Let me see what else. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Well, listen, this is only week one. We have, oh, let me put my comment in video before we cut off. Real quick, one moment. We have four more weeks going of the webinar Wednesdays. Next week, our special guest will be Mark Epp. And I'll be staying from Talent Plus and join us. We'll have more questions, more energy, more encouragement, more positivity. Keep, don't forget, spread love. Let's keep lifting each other up. I thank God for you and I wish you a, a successful remainder of your day and week. Theo, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. All right, bye everyone. Mm -hmm.